All right, tally-ho fiddle, totally done, all wrapped up. Um, this video has two purposes. One, uh, to answer some questions from previous videos. That'll be at the end, Q&A portion. Um, you may have seen part of this video already, just in a few days ago. Um, I posted a video that had an idea in it, and I asked for everyone's opinion on that idea to see if it would be good. And everyone loved the idea. Well, not everyone. A lot of people loved the idea, and I did too. That idea was to make a tally-ho pochette, like a pocket violin, um, in, all inspired by tally-ho. It'd be super fun with a portion, a lot of the proceeds going towards tally-ho as a fundraiser. Um, but I gotta be honest, I jumped the gun. Um, I really put up that video thinking I would just get a poll to see if they'd be interested in actually having it happen. In the background, I had emailed Leo and asked him if it would be okay if I did that. I had not heard back until this morning. So when I heard back this morning, um, I had to take that video down because he had a whole bunch of good reasons of why it would be a bad idea. And so he asked me not to do it. And I'd completely respect the Tally Ho Project and those people, and I would never uh, endanger their name or anything else or try and gain anything from them. Uh, and so, uh, for all bunch of reasons that I didn't even think about, um, we're not gonna do the raffle, we're not gonna raffle off a Tally Ho violin fiddle thing. Um, but that won't stop me from doing a raffle off of another instrument maybe in the future. So maybe a banjo or a regular violin um, or some other kind of creative project. So that may happen. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but what we'll do right now is I got some Q&A stuff from the previous videos. And if you guys have any recommendations of things you'd like to see on this channel, whether it's future builds, types of things you'd like to see, I'm all ears. I love the comments below you guys have been leaving, so I really, really appreciate it. Um, so keep that up. Anyhow, we'll move to the Q&A kind of portion of this, um, and thanks for watching. Oh, and not to interrupt myself, which I do all the time, uh, but I have some videos coming out soon of uh, a banjo build that I'm working on, as well as a case restoration project for a fiddle, um, as well as a fiddle long-term project thing that's hanging here, um, and a custom banjo coming up by December. So lots going on, so make sure you stay tuned. All right, so a question that I get uh, recently has been about cutting the mold out of the structure. Um, a few things. One, I'm an art professor. I had classes coming up in August when I was making this in the summer. And so not that I was in a rush, um, but I definitely felt the pressure of that coming up. And so I didn't think some of those things were as big of a big deal as some people wanted them to be. Um, they weren't a big deal to me, and so I didn't put them in. In hindsight, I should have because you guys hadn't seen that before, most likely. So the next one, you'll see it. Um, but the main reason I had was the mold normally bends out of the, of the rib structure, and this time it was so stuck that all I did was I put two handsaw cuts and just split it out in half, um, and then moved on to cleanup. So that's what happens, it gets, it's disposable. A lot of people keep them if they can. Um, oftentimes I make unique shapes every time, so I really don't keep them. I usually cut them out or dispose of them. Um, What kind of glue do you use? I've had this question a couple times. I use hot hide glue, which is a traditional glue in luthery as well as furniture making, as old as time is. Um, as soon as we figured out we could melt down rabbits, I guess, it's a great glue. Uh, the main reason you use, use it is it is super rock hard when it cures. Uh, it has a longer cure time, uh, which some people like and some people don't like, but the main reason you use it is it's still removable. So if I used wood glue and I need to make a repair or take the top off or adjust the neck at some point in the future, you couldn't really do that very well. With a hot hide glue, I've taken fingerboards off, tops off, necks out of instruments that are 80, 100 years old, um, and you can take the hot hide glue if they use it out and replace it. So you can actually heat up water or um, shrink it with denatured alcohol to, de to uh, dehydrate it and it would crack off. So there are a few different ways you can actually remove the hide glue. So that's why I use it. The other question I get a lot is, uh, how is this instrument gonna survive in the environment of Tally Ho, uh, the atmosphere out there? So I did my best to kind of figure this out and I'm making an educated guess. And it's an educated guess. Um, I work a lot in furniture, I work a lot in sculpture, and I work a lot in instruments. 
and all three of those require different moisture contents for the wood to act appropriately. If I take the moisture content of a piece of wood too high and it goes into a dry climate, it'll of course shrink and it won't work very well. If the exact opposite, if I take a very dry wood and I put it into a moist environment, it will swell and not behave well. Um, I had that happen one time when I was first getting into woodworking, I made a series of chairs that had drawers in them. And not thinking, when I was 20 whatever, uh, I made the drawers in winter. And I made them fit just right, because that's how I was trained to. And man, they fit just fantastic. And I was in Georgia, and I moved up to Kentucky, and those drawers would not open all summer, all fall. It was only in winter that they would open, and I could adjust them, because that wood would swell and change. So, um, for the Tally Ho Fiddle, what I did was I adjusted the moisture content of that wood more to acclimatize it to living near the ocean, especially the west coast, um, where it's a lot damper and um, more moisture in the air than here in central Kentucky or somewhere else. Um, so I got the wood super dry and then actually acclimatized it, put water in the atmosphere of a kiln to rehydrate it to a acceptable level so it's stable and then it's moisturized. So as it acclimatizes out there, it should not shrink and crack or swell and break. Um, also, I put a different kind of finish than I would normally put on a violin. Normally I would do a hand polish, like a French polish shellac finish or a traditional varnish. Um, for those guys out there, I wanted it to be easy to touch up and so it's actually a few different layers but the final kind of top coat is one that is really easy to touch up. It's readily available uh, and they can have that information to fix it themselves since they're craftsmen um, or have it fixed up out there if anything should happen to it. But that finish, unlike a varnish, allows the wood to breathe a little more. So I'm hoping that that will help with the moisture out there. Uh, I had some people ask about the pegs. Uh, so we'll address the pegs in a second. The two comments I got. One, the pegs stick out too far. That's intentional. Uh, second question people ask is, will the pegs loosen over time? Those are both related questions. Um, what I do is I have the tuning pegs and I pre-buy them because the amount of time to turn tuning pegs is ridiculous. Um, I pre-buy the pegs, but I return the taper on the peg to be smaller. I do that for a few reasons. Uh, one, aesthetics, but mainly to function, is as the life of the instrument continues on, when you turn those pegs in, slowly it will wear the holes in the peg box bigger and bigger. So if your pegs start in very short, they have a very short life. Um, these pegs will start out a little wider, but as the instrument turns, those pegs will slowly widen out the peg box the holes inside will slowly travel across the peg box, so I allowed for that. And then you can cut off the end of the pegs to make them look appropriate. Now, the reason I turn down those pegs is once the peg goes all the way in, you can discard those pegs, get new ones that are pre-made, and those should start to fit already, but at full length. So now, they have a whole nother life of those pegs and the instrument without having to repair or adjust the peg box. If I started with full diameter pegs and those would wear away the holes, now you are left with a hole in the peg box that no peg will fix, and so you have to repair that or make them smaller holes, which is kind of a, a bigger job. So that's why the pegs stick out. Um, and do I make my pegs? No, I buy them, but I turn down the taper uh, to actually adjust and allow for the age and wear over the life of the instrument. Is the bridge is sorry? Is the bridge freestanding or is it glued on? Uh, the bridge of a violin is freestanding. Uh, it's freestanding for a few reasons. One, uh, you don't want any other contact for transmission of sound to be absorbed, so glue or otherwise. Two, over the life of the instrument, you will change that bridge out multiple times, possibly for wear and tear because it's a lot of tension on that little piece of wood, uh, possibly for accident if it gets broken, also for your style of play. If you are a classical violinist and you want to make fiddle tunes, you can get a bridge that is set up for fiddle work. 
um, and vice versa. So you never leave it there. You can also adjust it for intonation um, over the life of the instrument. So that's why the bridge is removable and not glued on. Another bridge related question was what is the little piece of cloth or fabric or whatever people thought it was underneath the E string, the very tiny string on the bridge. Um, that is a piece of parchment that is put under that E string because the string is under so much pressure and especially with vibration over time, it will cut a groove, it will cut itself down into the bridge and damage it and alter the sound of the string, right? It'll pinch the string, it won't play correctly. So the other strings have enough width on them that they will actually sit on the wood and compress it but not cut it. The E string will start to cut through that bridge. So you'll see people put a piece of parchment there like I did, or some strings come with a little piece of plastic that sits under that string to prevent it from cutting through the bridge. So that's what that little piece is right there. Another question I got a couple times was, does the radius of the fingerboard have a correlation to the, ra the radius of the bridge? Yes. Uh, let me grab a fiddle right here. Uh, I got this one hanging right here. This is the one that I am learning to play on myself. Uh, this is another weird project you'll see coming up in the future. It has some unusual woods for a very specific purpose. Uh, but anyways, so the projection of the bridge you actually mark out where it goes onto, sorry, projection of the fingerboard. You actually mark out that projection onto the bridge to start your spacing for the strings. Um, and so you would then adjust the height or change the orientation of the bridge to get the correct string height from the fingerboard to the string. So the bass string needs to vibrate more, takes up more space than the E string under higher tension. So you usually have a little more space under the G string versus the E string. So yes, the fingerboard does predict the beginning shape of the bridge, but ultimately you alter it just a little bit. But there is a very strong correlation. So those are great questions. Um, if you guys have any more in the comments, please leave them below. Um, and please let me know what you think about a full out kind of tally-ho, pochette, pocket violin looking thing. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Have a great day.